Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here with you, the pioneering razor sharp cohort of publishing and students. It's, and, and I must say that um, just listening to where you're all from and the various talents and skills that are here, even without the training, you know, it's evident that um, our country is going places. And this program is obviously one that will ensure that that happens, just as we heard from Mr. Heidi Mokwede. It's difficult to overstate the importance of having well-trained, knowledgeable, and well-motivated public servants. Our governments have never been short of ideas, and I'm sure you know that. They're not short of ideas, policies, roadmaps. Indeed, we have some of the best written and most insightful policies on practically all issues. But we always fall flat on implementation. The reason is the quality of human resources that we deploy in the public sector. Unlike the private sector, where usually at least the profit motive makes it imperative for them to provide relevant and cutting edge training to ensure that their staff are well equipped and to be able to deliver on targets and KPIs. The public service, on the other hand, would usually you know, take the traditional approach. The result is a bureaucracy that's unable to develop, but more importantly, to deliver on government initiatives and programs. And that's really, that, that's really the problem that we have in the public service. So we have you know, the best programs. In fact, when I, when I, I came, to the office of the vice president in 2015. You know, of course, you know that people write all sorts of proposals, say all sorts of things. One thing I discovered very quickly was that on practically everything, there was already government policy or proposal or some incredibly insightful policy already. So there are piles and piles and piles of policies, piles and piles in the public service already. Once public goods, once you can't deliver public goods effectively, development suffers. The commons are all at risk, and the overall quality of life of the people is undermined. Which is why I think this program is so crucial. This is exactly what the public service needs. And just as Mr. Ayub Mokwudi has said, this is exactly the point, you know, and this is what informed a lot of our discussions at those initial stages of thinking this through. Everyone agrees that this is a problem. We need a bureaucracy that fully appreciates how to think, how to act, how to plan in a world that is completely transformed, especially in the last two decades. Almost every old assumption about commerce, about lifestyle, even about gender issues, political ideology are now being upturned. And, or at least even if they're not being upturned, they're seriously challenged. Practically everything that we used to take for granted is now being challenged. And so on, we yeah, spoke about technology and what it means today. So the old notions of official, sec of official secrecy, I wrote a book back in the, in the 90s uh, on Nigeria media law. I devoted a whole chapter to official secrecy. I looked at the book again, I think about two years ago, and I couldn't just believe the nonsense that, <laughs> that, is, now, that is now new knowledge. Because of reading that book, if anyone read, I have, of course, we're doing uh, a, a revision of If anyone read it today, you wonder uh, what part of the world are these people living in? <laughs> Everything has changed. The sanctity of government information, sanctity of communication is cracking all around. You know. These days, it's easier to put even hard copy public information in the public, in the public space. Every device has a camera. Electronically stored information given can also be hacked. So what are the new protocols that we must now adopt? What are the safeguards that we must put into regulations? What are the rules for using private phones or emails for public purposes? How about the emergence of tech companies and tech-enabled companies? What sort of regulatory environment will grow and not stifle innovation for the lady uh, from the central bank and all the others from the regulatory, the finance, uh, regulate, financial regulatory agencies. You know, what are the new rules we need to write? Some may remember the arguments back and forth about regulating cryptocurrency. 
SEC, as you know, at the time had drawn up rules about registering cryptocurrency companies. The CBN had a different view. Now, that is all extremely healthy because cryptocurrencies were completely new. No one knew where cryptocurrencies were headed. But that is the sort of thing that we're going to face now almost on a daily basis. The world is changing. Things are moving fast. There is nothing that we used to assume before that is going to be the same. So the sorts of individuals in the public service who write the rules and regulations, people like yourselves, must be people who now understand what is new. It means that you must read, and I'm going to come to that in a moment. But it also means that you must be ready for the changes. You can't sit down there and say, well, this is how we used to do it, uh, or this is what is in the books, and what is in the rules. We've got to change that. Writing the rules for new phenomena, stuff that the whole world is trying to grapple with, I'm doing so quickly, and with the understanding that there are types and challenges, these are the types of things that today's public officer will face. How about governance issues? Recognizing that ensuring integrity in the workplace is not just a moral issue, it's an existential issue for the country itself. If there is anything that is big, if there is any problem that today the governments of the, our governments, not just federal government, but state governments face, it is governance, integrity, corruption, petty corruption, grand corruption. Those are the major problems today. Everyone knows that, you know. Everyone knows that there's a problem. You want to get a, a, a passport, you want to get a, a license, you want to get a, you, you, you are trying to uh, get uh, some uh, contracts within, within the public service. Whatever you're trying to do within the public service, there are obstacles of various kinds. We all know that there is a, that, that there is a governance issue. If, and this is so, this is so, we have this and the all you know, aspects of the process. How do we deal with these issues? How do we let our organizations know that this is existential? It's not just a moral issue. The mere fact that one or two people can make money within an organization and possibly get away with it, at least for a while, doesn't mean that that is the end of the matter. We are incrementally and instrumentally destroying not just our institutions, but our nation. <clears throat> One of the reasons why prosperity is difficult is because of the problems that we have within the public service. Somebody comes with a, somebody comes with, a, with an idea, and, uh, you know, in fact, I recall that there was a particular person who donated a cancer a cancer uh, treatment um, facility to an agency. I don't want to mention names. It took, when we got here in 2015, the person, it was from an embassy, was saying to the president then that we have now, thank you very much, sir, we have now been able to install the cancer treatment uh, facility after almost six years. Why? Because people who were supposed the public officers within some of those places were asking, are asking for, uh, for, for, for PR, as they called it, or a bribe. They were saying, you have to give us something. Here are people donating a facility. You know? So all those kinds of things, of course, you know, I mean, they, they, and this is repeated here and there. So for me, one of the central questions that we have to answer, one of the central questions that I have to pose to you, is how do we deal with these issues? How do we deal with these governance issues? Because they are fundamental. And nothing, nothing gets done unless we're able to deal with some of those kinds of issues. Why do systems anywhere else in the world uphold basic <coughs> notions of honesty and transparency and integrity? It's because it makes economic sense. Dishonesty undermines the entire enterprise. It's not a moral issue, it's not just a mere moral issue, it's not a religious issue. No, it makes sense. The reason why the Singaporean government under the EU decided that they were going to be ruthless on issues of corruption is because they realized that their little nation will be completely destroyed if they allowed dishonesty within their system. Simple. 
And that's why they, are, they moved quickly to become the first world nation. We need to deal with that issue also. I must understand and be able to disseminate our rules of governance in such a way as to make it clear that whatever type of breaches of these rules of governance will kill progress. And as the president says, if not only if, if we don't kill corruption, corruption will kill us. I was fascinated by the contents of the classes on strengthening public uh, organizations, especially the question of who sets goals and values and what counts as high performance. You know. And I thought that that was really quite interesting because the public service, for the public service, this is a crucial issue, especially regulatory agencies. Because regulatory agencies generally tend to see their roles as either policemen or revenue generation. Yes, they may have those roles, but their real role must be how to make life easier for the private sector, small and large businesses, individuals who are the ones who create the jobs, they create the wealth, they lift millions out of poverty. The business of the regulator cannot be just to be a policeman or revenue generation and all of that. Your business must be to facilitate all of the private sector enterprises, businesses, and individuals, because that is where the wealth of the nation lies. People in the public sector, all of us complain, there are no jobs, there are no jobs, there are no jobs, but we are responsible to pull. Because if you don't, if, if for example, uh, NAFTA, and there's one from now, if for example, it takes a year, and I'm not necessarily criticizing NAFTA, but I'm saying that if for example, it takes a year, for me to register my product, if I'm, an, if, I'm, if I'm an entrepreneur, selling beauty products, and it takes me, and I've invested all the money I have trying to develop a product. I now develop 10, a range of 10 products or 15 products, and it takes me one year to get a NAPDAP number, and I don't get the NAPDAP number in one year. What happens to business? What happens to the business? If I don't have enough that number, I can't put my stuff in the supermarket. I've got to be selling under the table. Meanwhile, somebody else rushes off to Ghana, gets the equivalent of the enough that number. That person can sell in the supermarket in Nigeria. That's how it works. How do you, so, so the person who is sitting on their desk in NAFTA, who feels that, look, I'm a policeman, or who is making all sorts of demands, must ask the question, how am I damaging the economy of this country? How am I preventing people who want to make, who want to create jobs, who, because they're going to make money, will create jobs and create opportunities for everyone? How am I delaying that? How am I stopping that? But those are the sorts of questions that we must ask ourselves. What does high performance mean in a regulatory agency? Is it how many people you stop? Is it how many people you delay? Or is it how many people you are able to ensure get along and do their business? So we must be facilitators. In the, the, the various agencies, we must be facilitators. One of the things that we talk about extensively at PEBEC was what do we do with our regulatory agencies? You know, we have the um, MSME clinics, you know, which um, go all over the states of the Federation. We'll go with the regulatory agencies, all of the regulatory agencies. And what the whole idea is for the MSMEs to meet with the regulators so that they can complain and tell us about that. Everybody has a huge complaint about something or the other. But the whole point is that we want the regulator to understand that you are a facilitator, you are a business facilitator. If you are not facilitating business, if you are not making it easier for people to do business, then we have a problem. And that's one of the reasons why people complain about our business environment in Nigeria. I met with a group of ladies who do business in Abuja, almost 200 of them, and everybody had a complaint about somebody or the other coming, this time is environmental, this, the next one comes and says, you haven't paid this, you haven't paid that, it's difficult to get practically everything. So that kind of environment kills enterprise. And our, and our people are very enterprising, they want to do business. And so we ought to be able to support that. So performance must be determined by fidelity to the ultimate values that we pursue. What we want is an economy that is robust and prosperous. The only way by which we should be able to judge the performance of 
and regulatory agencies is how are you faithful to those values? Are you developing the sort of society we want? Are you developing the sort of economy we want? Or what exactly it is, is it that you're doing? So finally, if I may offer just one piece of advice, and it is really about self-development, about self-development. I think that, you know, most people from our part of the world, from Nigeria, that is, like the idea of certificates and getting some education. Everybody likes to, you know, display certificates and all that. But these things are merely a process. The best, the best people that you'll ever find anywhere in the world are people who are continuously educating themselves, people who are continuously reading. Reading is crucial, to, especially today, because things are changing at lightning speed. Anyone who is not reading, whatever you learned from this, uh, from the AIGPSG course, in another couple of months, You've got to, you will be surprised to find that there are all sorts of new ideas, new phenomena, all sorts of new things that are developing. So constant engagement, constant self-development uh, is so important. And that simply comes from reading. And today there are all sorts of uh, ways of reading, all sorts of ways. In fact, I don't know how many people have that app. There's one um, app that helps you to read uh, very, very uh, quickly. I mean, it summarizes things. For those who want uh, to be able to read a 400-page book in 15 minutes, at least it gives you a sense of uh, what is in the book. So at least you can keep, uh, you can keep reading. So I'd like to thank uh, a dear friend, Ike, for, uh, and, and of course, uh, his dear wife also for, first of all, for all the work that they've done. You know, I think, you know, first there is a, most people who do uh, the sort of work that they're doing, in, in other words, you know, a service to society, social enterprise of one sort or the other, are always able to distance themselves from it. So if you're a philanthropist of some sort, you know, you, things happen. You are not a part of it, you are not invested in it in the way that uh, this couple are invested in it. And I really want to thank you and commend you for that, that you are not just interested in the idea that you set up an organization, you are working you know, day and night looking at these issues and trying to do the very best you can. And especially for the public service of Nigeria, I mean, anyone who uh, if, you, if you work hard uh, with orphans and with uh, the very poor and all that, at least you almost feel that maybe God at least will reward you for it. I'm not so sure how one feels when you are giving back to the public service, whether you feel the same way. But I, but I must say that um, all of this work is service to God, so long as we're serving man and we're improving the quality of people, we are improving the quality of governments, we are serving God in a very, very unique and exceptional way. So I want to thank you and commend you all for that. And also to thank the, uh, the School of Government, uh, the Oxford University, for all of what, uh, for putting together all of this. And to say to the ladies and gentlemen who are here that uh, I wish you all the very best in the coming years, and um, I'm frankly waiting to see all of the great impact that uh, you will make. I don't think we need to have a, uh, the whole of the public service. Only a few people will make this difference, so long as that the few people are committed to making the difference. And I'm quite sure that you'll make all the difference. Thank you all very much. But I also want to commend uh, the Ivy Mokwede Foundation for ensuring that we have an all-female <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've been looking for a good way of, com of compensating, or at least saying something soothing to the women, uh, and my wife in particular, for the loss of the, uh, the, the amendments at the National Assembly. You know, I thought that was really quite uh, a terrible thing indeed. So I've been looking for something, some silver lining somewhere. And I think that uh, this is really <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.